Our reading this morning is from John chapter 13, starting to read at verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will also will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello and a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us online. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to John chapter 13 and we're reading verses 31 to 35. John 13, 31 to 35. Let's read together. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of God is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and, just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this will everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the privilege we have of being able to meet together online to be able to look at your word. Father, we ask you to open up our hearts and minds so that we'd hear you speaking to us. I pray, Father, that the words I speak will be your words, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, we're, we're, we've missed out a few verses from the passage that we looked at last week where Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. And in the, in the verses that we've missed out, um, Jesus has told his disciples that one of them will betray him. And after giving that uh, information to his disciples, Judas leaves. Jesus tells him, what you are about to do, do quickly. And Judas leaves. And the other disciples don't really understand what Jesus is saying as Judas leaves. And this is the point where we pick it up today in the reading that we have. The disciples are still in the upper room. Jesus has washed their feet. He's told them that they should act in the same way towards each other. And they've been confronted with the news that one of them will betray Jesus. And Judas has left. And it might seem strange that after Judas's departure, Jesus doesn't elaborate on what's happened. Or give comfort to the confused disciples. Instead, this is what we read. When he was gone, that's Judas, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. God is glorified in him. God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. What he's saying is that, that now the time has come for him to be exalted. He's come to the time of the accomplishment of the work that he's been sent to do. And it's now that is the fulfilment of his destiny. It's through his complete obedience to obey his father's will that he will be glorified and bring glory to God. 
In Philippians 2, verses 6 to 11, we read this. It says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection that God's full redemptive purpose is achieved. Jesus alone enables us to enter into that redemption and into the eternal presence of God. It's through his obedience to die on the cross for us and his resurrection that he's glorified and through which he will glorify God. And this is what he is talking about. He knows that his time has come, that he's fulfilled the Father's will for him and that he's going to the cross to die and completely fulfill God's will for him and his destiny. I'm not sure that the disciples at this point really understand what Jesus is talking about. I think it would be only later when they pondered on it that understanding would come. And Jesus doesn't actually give them at this point the opportunity to discuss further what he said about this. They may be feeling a little confused by what he said about the Son of Man being glorified and God being glorified in him. But they don't get the opportunity to discuss that further. Because Jesus goes on, straight on to say, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. I love the, that phrase, my, my children. For me, it conjures up an image of Jesus talking gently to them, knowing that they're vulnerable. And it's, he's speaking with them in love and concern for them. What he says would have reminded them of what he'd said earlier to the Jews. In chapter 8, we read this. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This is what he was referring to when he said, you will look for me just as I told the Jews. A few verses later, Peter asked Jesus about why they can't follow him. And Jesus tells him that they can't follow him now, but they will follow him later. But Jesus, but Jesus doesn't give Peter the chance to ask that question straight away. Because Jesus gives them something else to think about. He says that he's going to give them a new command. He's told them that the Son of Man will be glorified, that God will be glorified in him, that he's going away for a little while and they can't follow him. And now he says, he goes straight on to talk about a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He hasn't given them chance really to, to talk back, to question anything that he said. He's given them three things one after the other. And he talks about this new commandment to love one another. 
we might say, well, it isn't really a new commandment, is it? Because we read that it's an old commandment in answer to a question about which is the greatest commandment Jesus had said love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind with all your strength the second is this love your neighbor as yourself there is no other commandment greater than these so why does Jesus say a new commandment I give you to love one another why is this new well it wasn't in one sense new because loving God and loving your neighbor was the cornerstone of the mosaic law but on the other hand it was new it was new in the sense of something new and fresh the opposite of something outworn in a in a similar way that we might say i've got a new car when what we've bought is a second-hand car the car itself isn't new but it's new to us and it will be used in a new way to what it was used previously by its previous owners so let's have a think about what makes this commandment new new command i give you love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another by this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another so why was it new well firstly the old commandment talked about loving our neighbors as ourselves and this new commandment talks about loving one another as we saw last week this is primarily directed towards the disciples and through them those who will believe to us the church they were commanded to love one another and we are to love one another the old commandment talked about loving our neighbours as ourselves and sometimes we're not very good at loving ourselves are we so that probably means that we're not very good at loving our neighbour either the new commandment talks about loving one another as I Jesus have loved you so think about that for a moment love one another as i have loved you that's a whole different type of love and it takes this commandment to a whole different level jesus loved them so much that he gave his life for them a few chapters further on in chapter 15 we read my command is this love each other as i have loved you greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for one's friends you are my friends if you do what i command the implication is that they and we should be prepared to do the same that's real sacrificial love think for a moment of how jesus loved the disciples last week we saw how he demonstrated his love by taking on the role of a servant he showed how much he loved them and he did that for all of them including judas who would betray him peter who would deny him and the others who would fail to stand by him in his hour of need knowing that it didn't stop him loving them throughout his ministry jesus spent time with his disciples he took a very unconventional and in the world's eyes an unpromising group of people 
and through his love for them, he enabled them to become the body of people through which the church would grow. Jesus didn't just work with the intelligent or well-educated. He loved all of them. And that's the love he's commanding the disciples to show. The second thing that is different about this command is the purpose of the command. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By loving each other, they would show the world who they are. And others would be drawn to the love of God by the love they showed to each other. And the early church we read of in Acts, although by no means a perfect church, did to some degree do this. In Acts 2 we read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The love they demonstrated to each other was so attractive. People wanted to be part of this community that loved each other. It was vibrant, exciting, attractive, a new way of living where the people looked out for the needs of each other in order to be able to devote themselves to teaching, prayer and fellowship. Needs were met and the focus was on God. And the same should be true for us. It will be our love for each other that attracts people to the church in order for them to learn of God and to enjoy fellowship and praise. We must be the people who demonstrate that radical, sacrificial love for each other if we want people to come into the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how sound our theological arguments are if we don't have that radical love for each other. If we don't have that radical love for one another, then our preaching and teaching is useless. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding song, gong, or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. If the church truly demonstrated that kind of love to each other, then our churches would be overflowing. A while ago, someone I don't really know, told me that you could easily substitute the word Jesus for the word love in that paragraph. So it would read, Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind. He does not envy, he does not boast, he is not proud. 
he is not rude, he is not self-seeking, he is not easily angered, he keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It reads well. It fits. Because Jesus is love. But he's commanded us to love in that same way. So, what if you substitute the word love with your own name or I? It makes slightly more uncomfortable reading because can we really say those words truthfully? Are we always patient, always kind? Do we envy, do we boast, are we proud? Can we be rude and self-seeking? Can we easily get angered? Do we keep a record of wrongs? Do we always tell the truth? Do we always protect, trust, hope and persevere? It makes it slightly uncomfortable. But that's the radical love that Jesus is calling us to. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It is this radical, self-sacrificial love that we are commanded to show each other. And it's a command to love in a way that will change who we are as a church and will draw others into the kingdom of God. But it's hard. It's difficult. And I'll go to far, as far as to say it's impossible for us to love in this way if we try to do it in our own strength. We are likely to fail. In order to love in this way, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to be able to love with that radical love of Jesus. So are we prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives so that we can love each other with the radical love that Jesus commands us to show each other. I'd invite you to think about that, to ponder on those things. Do we love each other with that love that Jesus commands us? Are there things we need to work on? Maybe pick up that passage from Corinthians and think about those areas that we might need to work on in order to be able to love one another as Jesus has loved us, so that everyone will know that we are his disciples. Let us pray. Father, please help us to love one another with the sacrificial love that Jesus had for us. Thank you that he demonstrated his love for us by dying for us while we were still sinners. Help us to be prepared to give our all for each other. Help us to be patient and kind, not envying or dishonouring one another. Help us not to be boastful, proud, rude or self-seeking. Help us not to be easily angered or to keep a record of wrongs. Help us not to delight in evil but to rejoice in truth. May we always protect, trust, and persevere with one another. Holy Spirit, teach us day by day to love one another more deeply, that others will want to know you through our love for you and each other. Amen.